Welcome to Save Our Sleep. Tizzy and the Save Our Sleep team believe it's every child's right to receive comfort, a parent's right to demonstrate love, and everyone's right to a full night of sleep. This podcast is not a medical or scientific volume, but a collection of tried and tested solutions and tips based on my many years of experience with babies and young children. Its main purpose is to help parents understand and avoid sleep problems in young babies and toddlers. We'd like to recognise the Wadawurrung people who are the traditional owners of this region which Tizzy and myself live and are recording today's podcast on. We acknowledge and respect that they have taken care of this land and water and raised children in this nation for over an extraordinary 70,000 years. The Save Our Sleep podcast is dedicated to helping you prevent and solve sleep problems while having some fun along the way. We endeavour to discuss all things family related, starting from preconception all the way through to an adult child leaving home and beyond. Some topics may be triggering. If you find this is the case, please reach out to your or your child's health nurse or general practitioner. Hi Tizzy, how are you? What's the crack? Oh, g'day. (laughs) We are so not good at this. Uh, how have you been? I don't know. Well, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, let's start off with, okay, so it's episode five. Let's do a little bit of a rundown. So we've record, we had a little break between episode four and today. So episode five is going to go to air on Australia's Mother's Day. But episode four, like there's a bit of a gap. So it's a bit weird because there's this whole kind of few It's weeks. weird for us. It's weird <laughs> it for us. It won't be weird for you. <laughs> no, well, it's going to be weird for the listeners too because. A bit of time So passed. how have we been? Well, a bit of time's passed. Mm. So last time we were here, Ron was really, really ill. Mm. And I think he's probably spent, Ron is Nathan's dad, my father-in-law, who I absolutely love to death. I did say in one of the podcasts, like, we're going away in a boat and, and the bad thing is Nathan's parents are coming. I didn't mean the bad I thing was my were in-laws joking. were coming. No, I wasn't joking. Mm. I meant we were so scared that we, the children, the mm. family, might give the grandparents uh, COVID, that we were scared about them coming on the boat. So, anyhow, sadly, Ron did get COVID. The good news is he's had ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. The Geelong Hospital, I would just like to thank the Geelong University Hospital They have been amazing. I'm very lucky. I have lots of medical friends and I got very good advice where, you know, don't go to this hospital or that hospital. You need to go to the big teaching hospital where you'll get the best care. He's been in hospital for about five weeks now. So it's been about five weeks and it's, but he was in a room. They had him in a room. So they had him in a room all by himself. And he's been staring at four walls and counting ants on the walls. And he obviously had COVID. So he had to be in an isolation room and in a room by himself. He then, uh, we chatted to the hospital and they've moved him into a room with other people. So he's been in a room by himself, I think, for about three and a half weeks. Okay. And then he actually got transferred to Grace McKellar, which is another for rehab, but that only lasted a day. Mm-hmm. And then he was taken back to hospital because he was too ill. <clears throat> and then when he came back, the sad thing was he had to be in accident emergency on a trolley for ages. Again, the good thing was they've put him in a room with three or four other people. So he's in a much better place and being with other people is making him improve. And we actually think he's on the improve. Oh, that's great. We actually think he's getting better. So that's good. Oh, that's so great to hear. Not out of the, he's out of the woods. He's not home, but he's getting better. That's That's really good. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the update. Um, Just trying to think where I left off. I think the last um, little bit of personal information I gave was about the, um, Diabetes. diabetes test and uh, I'm absolutely dev- devastated many? to say that I have been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. How many <clears> weeks <throat> are you now? Uh, I'm 33 weeks today, which is just amazing and just feels so, so, so surreal. Um, I've been in hospital a few times for monitoring just um, if I haven't felt baby move or the other day I was driving Luke's car and it gave me some really strange cramps. So I haven't been shy to go in and see the girls at MAU or the girls and the boys there. Um, But baby's going really well. Um, But gosh, 
gestational diabetes is so much more involved than I could have ever imagined. Um, I know nothing about it. No, well, I knew nothing about it either. Um, so just basically I'm quite low level, which means I'm not – they're not getting me to take insulin just yet, um, but to hopefully um, – get on top of it with diet and exercise. So there, what I need to do is eat um, six times a day. Is that right? Yeah, six times a day. Uh, three of those meals need to be substantial balanced meals with, you know, like they really specific. You've got to have your three serves of low GI carbohydrates. Um, and then I can't eat anything for two hours after that. And then I have to test my uh, blood sugar levels Um two hours after I've eaten and then I can go ahead and eat again for a bit. And it is so tricky to do, especially when you've already got kids. So you would know that um, most carers might be lucky to eat a full brekkie without standing up and tending to a child's nappy or something like that. Um, and then it's – we. I've just eaten the scraps from the boys all day and then I might get a, a full dinner at the end of the day. So just eating solid meals in a, in – a 24-hour period I'm finding really, really tricky and I've got to exercise too. My numbers are spiking. I'm getting a bit of help um, and uh, hopefully I can get on top of it. But at this stage, yeah, uh, 33 not weeks is fantastic. Yes. So I had Dara at a lot earlier than that mm -hmm. and I had uh, – there's debate as to actually how long I had gone with Dara and so on, so we're not going to put dates on it, but I had – Killian, I think at 34 weeks, the doctor oh, wow. thought 34 weeks. I always thought he was 35 weeks and mm -hmm. he came out breastfeeding. So I think he was 35 weeks. Yep. And then Kieran, I had at 32 weeks. They said I couldn't go past 30 weeks and I had him at 32 weeks. So to me, I'm like so excited because I think your baby's cooked and yes. will come out doing really well. And I think we're kind of past the risk. So even yeah. though you're trying to do this. Yep. diabetes and it's scary yep. I'm also very excited because I think it's good yes you know? I agree yeah, yeah definitely yeah so looking forward to next week's update on your diabetes yes and yep. uh yeah now and yeah and congratulations for getting to 33 weeks Thank what you. was it like when you passed the milestone the boys came at 25 <laughs> weeks and Three yeah. days. So yeah. it must have been a bit of passing was, that milestone how was that yeah um it's it was a subconscious thing for me and um, the really bizarre thing, it wasn't at the 25 weeks and three days, but it was when we ticked over to 25 weeks, which I was surprised because on the app on my phone that I'm using to follow my um, weekly progress, it sort of ticked over a day earlier than I expected. Um, and it must have played on my mind because I got for the first time ever Braxton Hicks that night. And it was just so, Amazing, yeah, it? so bizarre. And I haven't had them since, except for those funny cramps in Luke's car the other day, but it must have been the angle I was sitting on. But, um, yeah, so it definitely, I didn't think that it affected me that much, especially because it was only 25 weeks, not and the three days, but it must have, and it must have had a physiological impact on me, which I just find is so incredible. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's us. And um, what do you so think? So this is your last Mother's Day as a mother oh, with two Day. running around children because yes. yes. this is Mother's Day. So today when this goes to air, it'll be the Australian Mother's Day oh, now. Happy Mother's Day. To I, I remember yeah. Mother's Day has been very interesting for me. I've had some very hard Mother's Days. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll do a little bit of extra chatting today because it Why is not? Mother's Day and normally we'd only do a few minutes at the beginning. But, you know. We, I had a lot of pregnancy loss and I found Mother's Day really, really hard yeah. because in one of my obstetrician appointments, the obstetrician actually asked Nathan to leave the room and then he asked if Nathan was the father of all of our pregnancies. And that was the point where I thought, oh, well, if Nathan's a father, I'm a mother, you know? Yeah. And I found Mother's Day really hard before I'd brought a baby home from yeah. hospital because it was Mother's Day and I had had you know, all these sort of full starts and no baby at home with us. Then, and I don't really remember my first Mother's Day with Dara, but I do remember my first Mother's Day with Killian, mm -hmm. but only because it was a different type of thing. So mm -hmm. what happened was I'd miss the Irish Mum's Day because that happens a different, must be in March. Right. And now it was Australian's Mother's Day and we were over in Italy following the Giro and Nathan's friend was cycling in the Giro and we were over in Italy following the Giro 
And we decided to take a day away from the Giro. And I get very angry when I'm hungry. How do you say it? Hangry? Hangry. Just and quickly, sorry, what's the Giro? The Giro. The Giro, it's a bit like the Tour de France, but it's the Italian ah, version and okay. it's pink. Okay. So we were at the Giro, okay? And it was pink. And anyway, we were over there and we put in the navigator to not go on the main roads. We wanted to go on the not main roads, mm -hmm. okay? So we decided that we were going to uh, go... Uh, it, Following the race, and we'll talk more about the Tour de France, which isn't as exciting or the Giro as you think it is because you just do a lot of driving between sure. stages. Anyhow, we decided to not go on the road and we're driving. So we put in don't go on motorways and we're driving and driving and driving and we, we drive and drive and we must have driven for about 12 hours. And this was with an 18 or a, probably a 21 month old and a five month old. And we, it had said there was a campsite, but we couldn't find the camp. And we drove and we drove and we drove and we drove. And seriously, I swear we drove for days. And then eventually it was pitch black and we found this campsite. And I want to find the campsite again. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I wish, I wonder if I can go back and look at mobile phone bills. Actually, that might be a really good idea. Anyhow, we... We went to this campsite, we got there, it was pitch black and Nathan got out of the camper van to go and ask and he got attacked by a dog. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't, I can't be at this campsite because I've got a small baby and a toddler and this dog's going to, and it was awful. It was yeah. absolutely awful. And I was starving and I have a bit of an eating disorder and I'm funny about where I can eat. Yeah. And I was just so worried about this. And there was no food. We had no Aww. food. The fridge was broken. We had no food. I was a breastfeeding mum. Oh my God. There was no food in the camper. This was pretty bad. Okay. Anyway. So Nathan goes in and he basically, it's like Joseph and Mary, is there any room at the inn? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we parked up next to the one other camper van. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, we went in, they told us to come in and they'd cook us dinner. And he said, we've, I've got no food. We've got no food in. We weren't expecting you, but we'll cook you dinner with the scraps that we have here. Oh, oh my goodness. The food kept coming. I think it was the best food and the best Mother's Day I've ever had. Oh, bellissimo. I think it was the best food I've ever eaten. Yeah, wow. And this guy just kept bringing all this food. And then Nathan and I were so full. And then he brought us like these little serves of ice cream. What's it called? The gelato or something. All right. And we were like, oh, thank God the meal's over. No, it was between courses. We had <laughs> souffle. We had steak. We had. And then wow. the actual dessert was a sponge cake filled with ice cream. Oh, this guy just. It was the best food we've ever eaten, maybe because we were starving. Mm. Then we went to bed in the camper van and we got up in the morning and it was the most amazing place. It was a children's farm. We ended up staying for three days. Aww. It was the most amazing campsite we've ever been yeah. to. Yeah. So that was our good Mother's Day oh, that started as a disaster. Yes, and yes. eventually we got back to the Giro. Oh, you'll never forget it. What a great story. I love it. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Can you remember a first Mother's Day? Not really. <laughs> I, was, I was in hospital. The boys were still in hospital. Um, so I don't know. I, Yeah, I think I got photos. I think I'm in the paper somewhere if you want to look up the amazing, the Royal Women's um, website or, you know, maybe their socials or something. Um, but I just remember just an overwhelm of feeling grateful. Yeah, yeah. And the boys were in hospital for about 100 days? Yeah, so Sid 99 and Otto 121. Yeah. <clears throat> You're a numbers yeah. woman. I'm surprised you yes. don't remember those. <laughs> okay, um, that's my homework. But I'll never forget them. Um, yeah, no, so, yeah, Mother's Day is just, uh, yeah, all I've ever wanted to be is a mum. So it's um, just right. a beautiful day to be grateful and thankful. Yeah. Talking of Mother's Day, yeah. I have some mothering to do. Uh -huh. I have to correct oh. my incorrect information <laughs> on my children's like... ages. I got very confused. Now, maybe I shouldn't try again. Oh, so, Kieran. I'm prepared. Is... Have you got to read? It's not written no, down on your notes. Kieran is, is seven. Mm -hmm. Killian is 12. And Dara is 14. And Ruby and Ivy, who are not our children, who spend a lot of time with us, are now 10. Ivy is now 10. And Ruby is now 13. Okay. Because Killian catches up with her in October and it's the same day as her mother's birthday. Okay. okay so apologies, children, for not knowing your ages. Actually, all of my children have gone up one year in age since our first podcast. There you go. Let's move on. Episode right. five, mm -hmm. we are going to talk about... Zoe's favourite subject. Yeah, I do love this subject, baby talk. And can I start the um, topic by reading your first paragraph of the book, Tizzy? 
it's of a really the book, like this. Uh, of baby uh, in talk. the book, yeah. So yes. page twenty it is. Um, <clears throat> so Tizzy has, I believe you should talk to your baby as if she is an adult from day one. Start by telling your baby what you're going to do to her rather than just doing it. For example, before pulling her legs up to change her nappy, explain why. This helps your baby to feel much more in control and will give her a feeling of security. And, 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 and. So there's so much more benefits. Babies learning communication. Um, they're, they're learning to trust you as a carer. Um, they're, they're, I just, they're learning your voice. Yes. And, um, oh gosh, like there is just so much to this and I think that it's such a respectful uh, way to treat your child and um, I think I really want to encourage people from treating a child like a blob that doesn't understand anything because, in fact, research is showing that babies are learning language even when they're in our womb. So we must treat them as, you know, whole human beings, you know. And I just love this about your – I loved finding that on page 20 and the importance that you put on that in your books. I – and one of my – things that I find really interesting is so many people use a different voice when they're yes. talking to their children yeah. and it drives me insane. Like, hello, you, baby, look at the baby. Yes. Oh, look at your little feet. Yes. Oh, I'm just in here. And I just think, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, we, It's you bizarre. Know, Why do we do that? I don't know. And is it a cute thing? I don't know, mm. but it, it makes my skin crawl. Nathan's skin crawls when mm. people rub their fingers on balloons. My screen calls when I hear people talking to their babies and they, they'll turn around to their husband and they'll say, would you like a, a would you like a, a, well, they probably know, would you like a cappuccino, a, cup of, a cappuccino, but would you, would you like, Steve, would you like a cup of tea? And then he goes, oh, yes, please, I'll make it. And then you say to the baby, oh, would you like to play yeah. with that little red car? And you think, oh, what are they doing? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, it, it's, know. it's, it's, um, portraying, oh, what's the word? It's putting something on baby that isn't necessarily a thing. You know, you're treating baby as a different being to, a three-year-old or a six-year-old, nine-year-old, 20-year-old. But some people still do it, the three-year-olds. But yes. 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 And what amazes me is like people don't think children understand. Mm. So, you know, you, most people get their puppy when it's about between six and eight weeks old, mm. right? Now, they will say to the puppy, walkies, walkies, like, you know, and the puppy Will and it, and they use that voice as well, like walkies, sure. walkies. Like they go walkies and, or whatever. And, and really, and there's, should we just say that it's okay that you talk to children, children and babies like that? It it's, is okay. It's fine. It's, it's not going to cause any damage. But, but it's, it's just it's interesting. Just funny. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so it is interesting. And they say to the dog, walkies, and the puppy, which is about eight weeks old, yes. will run to the front door or run to the chair that you keep the lead so on right. or run to the cupboard where the lead is or run to the back door, whatever. Yeah. But yet we think our eight-week-old human doesn't understand English Such a good or point. French or Italian or whatever language you're you're speaking. Mm. And I find it really, really interesting. Yes. And I also find it really interesting that, like, it happens. I see it all. I used to pre-COVID. Mm. I, I really have suffered with COVID mental health-wise because yeah. I don't have any, even spent any time with babies. Like, mm. and, But pre-COVID, I used to see people and they'd... Walk into the hospital room. So I'd have some very close friends who, and by the way, one of the things I want to do is go to a birth. I've never been to a birth and I would love to go to a birth. And if anybody wants me to come to their baby's oh. birth, I want to be at a birth. I wasn't even at my own children's births because of complications. Sure. I feel like I was just kind of knocked out and then handed mm. babies weeks later. Like mm. it's, I want to be at a birth. If anyone wants me at their birth, I'd love to come. Anyhow. But one of the things I often go and visit very close friends just after they have a baby and I see relatives come in. They don't even talk to the mum. They don't even walk over to the mum. They don't even ask the mum. They walk straight in and they pick that baby mm. straight up. With no, like they don't ask permission. They just imagine if you just, if somebody, if I just came up to you now mm. and just started doing stuff mm, to I you. Know, like, I know. Okay. Especially like I've had this bowel surgery and I look pregnant mm. and it happened in Y River. We went camping mm. and somebody walked up to me in the cafe in Y River. And they obviously were in a queue. We were waiting on coffee. I was the only person wearing a mask, so they couldn't see my facial expression. But, mm. you know, I was standing there and I could feel my bowel moving 
And I could kind of see my bowel movements, like it was clearly to me that there was some poo or something going down my bowel, and I could see it moving on the front of what looked like a, a maternity top. And this person just walked up, put their hand on my stomach and said, oh, is that the baby's bottom? Or you're definitely having a boy with its bottom sticking out like that. And I'm thinking, first of all, they don't know if I've actually ever successfully had any children. Second of all, it could have been a stoma and they could have actually damaged it. Right. It's happened to me a lot. Have I not told you that, Zoe? No, I'm so People keep touching my bowel and then I go, sometimes I go, oh yeah, I'm six months. And then they go, oh, you're so big. Or they go, oh, you're so small. And sometimes I go... Like it's easier just to say sometimes, oh yeah, I'm six yep, months sure. and they go, oh, congratulations, and you, and you move on, than to say, actually, you've just touched my poo. That's my <laughs> bowel. I've had surgery. Like it's, but they sure. just touch you. And yep. imagine and a baby. Okay. Yeah. And I'm an adult, and it takes me a few minutes to get over the fact that somebody's just walked into my space mm. and touched me. Mm. Imagine the baby. Now mm. I say to parents, when you bring your baby home from hospital, if you have older siblings, you've got to be a little bit more careful, like you've Mm -hmm. got to make sure that, you know, especially if the sibling comes to visit in hospital, Mm -hmm. that you make a deal of the sibling, like, oh, let's say you're, let's say Otto and, like, Mm. let's say you only have one child, he's called Otto. So Otto comes to hospital and then Luke brings him in and you go, oh, Otto, mummy's so happy to see you. And actually, here's a really good tip here and some things about siblings and children is, it's not always a good idea to bring the child to the hospital to see mummy every day. Because if you've got, depending on the age, mm. if you've got like an 18 month old or a 20 month old mm. and mum's there and you tell them when mummy has the baby, mummy is going to go away for a few days to have the baby. Not mummy's going to go away for a few days to spend time sure. with the baby. Yes. Just mummy's going to go away for a few days to have the baby. Mm. Daddy will look after you or mm. granny will look after you. Mm. One day you might wake up and it's going to be really, really exciting Mm. because you might wake up one day, Otto, and mummy won't be at home because mummy's gone to have the baby. Mm. And it's going to be so exciting because daddy's going to maybe, depending on your child, bring you to see the baby. Or next time you see mummy, mummy will bring home the baby and mummy will be so excited to see you, Otto. Mm. And mummy will be so excited for your baby to meet you and make it more, you know, and not negative. Okay, And then... If you've got a child who's very clingy and doesn't, like, children sometimes go to daycare. Some children don't. Some children are with mum. Even Mm. children who go to daycare, Mm. they can be very clingy to mum and they won't understand the hospital. And If you bring this toddler to the hospital to meet their new baby Mm. and then you have to come and then they have to leave, that can be really traumatic for mum and really traumatic for the baby because the toddler's thinking, why is mum staying with the baby? And also the toddler's thinking, I want to spend time with my new baby. Mm. And it's very confusing. So Mm. depending on the age of your child and how much they can comprehend, Mm. sometimes it's better to bring your toddler to the hospital when you're ready to leave. So the toddler comes to the hospital, you do all those nice meeting in the hospital videos and photos of Facebooks, Instagrams, whatever you need to do. This was before COVID. Hopefully we can still do this. Mm. And then leave together as a family, Mm. even if dad then takes toddler off for a baby chino or something or or for a walk while mum does the checkouts and whatever. Or if there's another grandparent or someone there. But don't leave the hospital Mm. if you've got a clingy toddler Mm. without mum and the baby. So that's important. Yeah. And don't don't have a baby without reading up on this, and you cover it a bit more deeply in your books, but um, I just think the impact that bringing a new child home to pre-existing children. Including pets? Oh, no, pets. No, because if you've never had a baby, your pets are your children. Yes, but no, it, that's a whole other topic because I did do that with our dog, with the boys, and we actually made it nothing and it was nothing. We didn't do the introduction to the dog or anything like that and we just brought them home and said, G'day, Louie, to the dog and just acted but, like it was nothing and so Louie didn't think it was anything and it was never a thing. And yeah. so, But you have, is Louie an outdoor dog? Oh, you? yeah, a bit of both, probably. So I've got outdoor. clients and friends who their cats and their dogs are everything, mm. okay? So I... I teach some of my clients, you know, to have a mat on the ground that the dog's not allowed on way before the baby Mm -hmm. comes. But that's a whole other subject so that the dog knows not to go on the mat. And then when the baby arrives and goes on the mat, but that could be a whole topic in itself and we won't go into it today. But back to baby talk. Mm. So you're bringing the baby Mm. home from hospital. And if you don't have another sibling, you're bringing the baby home from hospital. If you don't have another sibling, then 
you can bring the baby in and go, this is mummy's office and this is where you're going to live and talk to the baby like a human. And then when you go, even in hospital, when you go to change the baby's bottom, say, take their feet, can you lift your bottom up? Mummy's just going to change your nappy. And you said to me recently, Zoe, that you loved on the video. So I have a YouTube video of how to put a baby. It's called, Some places it's called five-week-old baby and some places it's called how to put a newborn baby to bed. And it's a new video. And at the moment, there's a little baby with a green comforter on the front. It's so cute. Mac. Mac was a baby. Mm-hmm. And I said to Mac, oh, Tizzy's just doing this and Tizzy's just... And I didn't realise. And you said to me afterwards, I love the way... And I had to go back and watch it, but I didn't even... It's so natural to me. Yes. I'm is. just going to... Like with a toddler, I'm just going to lift you up and put you into the car seat. You know, mm. I don't just pick them up and put them into the car mm. seat. Mm. And that way, at least with my kids, they can they can protect their head in case I whack them again yes. on the door frame. How yeah. many people have whacked know, their kids' yeah, heads yeah. on the on the door frame of the car? You know, but very, very important. Very, very important that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lift your your yeah. bum up when I'm, tr- you know, when I'm changing a nappy. Can you lift your bum up? Is it okay if mummy does this? Yes. You know, and, yes. And really chat to them. And uh, another thing, another word that it teaches or helps um, babies become aware of is autonomy and uh, a sense of self. So we, um, we're growing our children these days to um, understand that it's their body, their choice. So we don't... Um, force oh go and give Annie Sue a kiss you know we don't do that anymore would you like to give Annie Sue a kiss goodbye and so that starts from a baby you know I'm I'm going to pick you up now is that okay and and get them involved you know I had some children who I used to have in my care and I'd say to them you know would you like to um so we're going to go now you know you're going to go now you're going to leave and you're going to go and Hmm. and off with such and such and what are we doing a handshake, a yes. fist, oh, this. Yep. And one of the children was so always what was really huggy and always wanted to hug me and oh. kiss me and, and hold me and was very. And sometimes I think, is it too much? Like, is the other person here watching how I'm caring for these children mm. not going to like mm-hmm. this? You know, and, which is a horrible thing because mm. it's mm. beautiful. But the other child was very standoffish. Mm. And I'd say, do you want to do a, a fist, a, a high five of this? No. Oh, that's okay. Would you like to say goodbye to Tizzy? No, that's okay. And then on about week seven, mm-hmm. it was like high five. And then one day out of nowhere, yes. when it was time to go, this kid just hugged yeah. me. Yeah. And it was we'd really genuine that respect. And yes. And wanted to get in for the hug before the sibling yep. who'd hugged me from day one yeah, got wow. in for the hug. Like yeah. it is. I love that. Children are amazing. They are. And so, but back to the baby talk mm. for a minute. So, what's really a couple of things which which I'd like to touch on with the baby talk is uh, is COVID. So pre COVID, okay. So let's forget about COVID for a minute and say pre COVID. I have on my desk at home a little clip from a newspaper where they talk about research that they did where a baby in a pram that faces you when you're walking. Now, picture this. I did a lot of work in London. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time in London. In London, first of all, everybody helps you. You can walk down the street. You get to stairs. There's stairs at the tube station. Everyone helps you lift your pram up and down the stairs. They help you with your children. So different right. here. Yeah. It's just so di- I find it very, very different wow. here. But maybe it's because we don't have the tube stations. But, sure. Yeah. But anyway, in London, if you've got a child and they're in a buggy or a pram faced away from you, all they can see is knees and bottoms, knees and bottoms, knees and bottoms. There's crowds of people and all they can see is knees and bottoms. Mm. It, they did this research where they took the same children and they turned them around mm-hmm. so that the pram was facing the parent and it was extended rear facing. And lots of people say, oh, my children don't like it. They like to see where they're going. Mm. But do they? Like if the child is facing the parent for longer If you picture if we went for a walk, Zoe, Mm. and we're chatting to each other, the child is, even if you're a parent who's walking with your hand on the pram and you're on the mobile phone talking, Mm -hmm. your child is observing your speech, your talk, what you look like, how you're saying words. They proved that the heartbeat of the children who faced their parents was better and less stressed than the heartbeat of the children who faced away from their parents into the wind and into the oh, bums wow. and so on. Yeah. And the children who face their parents 
fell asleep and slept for longer while out walking than children who faced away from their parents. So some of it would be the wind factor. Some of it would just be to be able to see your parents. But then (laughs) that brings me to the new research that they're doing in London. Mm. And you can Google it about COVID Mm. and how it's affecting children because these parents are out walking with masks on. And the children can hear them speak but can't see them speak mm. and all of that what is the word for like passive learning like that mm. they're learning by watching you while yeah. you're walking and Most talking but you're not because you've got a mask on right. so they're saying that the age of speech for children during covid in the major lockdowns like places where they've had really masks every time you leave the house Mm -hmm. and children who've gone to daycare Mm -hmm. at the same time so in london some people go children go to nursery from six weeks nursery is daycare from six weeks and uh people they're saying that these children's speech is going to be delayed they will eventually learn to speak like children with languages but it is delayed isn't that fascinating Mm -hmm. it is yeah yeah yeah, I've been waiting for the research on that. So well, thanks. doing it. Yeah. And the other uh, point mm. is with baby and mm. baby talk and so on, mm. which fascinates me slightly off topic, mm. but fascinates me is black and white. Mm-hmm. Ch- well, children don't really, at first, they only see black and grey when they're born and they don't yep. really see colour yep. until they're about four months old. Mm. Have you seen those books? Because mm. we sell a lot of them at ones. Easter yep. where we've got an Easter bunny with Easter eggs. We've got black and white books. I love them. Yeah. So on the Save Our Sleep website, we put the black and white books and they're all so good. And the kids mm. love the black and white. Yes. Like it's it's really important mm. that they see black and white mm. pictures and so on. Oh, and the other thing when we're talking about baby talk mm. is uh, – is with the child, do they recognise themselves? So mm. if you, is there an age in that, Zoe, of what age it is that a baby sees themselves? So when you put a sticker on a child, if you from three months old put a sticker on the nose of your baby, like a, not a really mm. stick sticker, just a tiny little sticker on the nose of the baby and put them in front of a mirror and they don't, they try mm. to reach the sticker in the mirror. Mm. And then you do it at four months, five months. Can we do it with this baby? Uh, yeah. Six months, seven months. And then at one point, does is there they an realize age? there's no age. Okay. I think from memory it's around eight, eight months. Like it's quite so a fair bit of they bit suddenly of... look in the mirror and they take the sticker off their yes. own nose. Yes. And that's when they realize that they're yeah. it's their reflection. It's them, it's, it's their oh, reflection. Yeah. It's, it's like, amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, another little bit that I've highlighted here in your baby talk section, Tizzy, is um, as your babies get older, ask for her, or as your baby gets older, ask her for her, for her cooperation when doing things such as bathing and changing a nappy. And um, I wanted to bring up a story about Sid and Otto that once they started uh, walking, they decided they didn't want me to change their nappies anymore. And this was before I had really delved into the research surrounding um, the, the importance of communicating properly and asking as opposed to doing um, and giving warning. That's another thing that you've always done, uh, which I love is it's not just it's bedtime, it's in five minutes, it's bedtime, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but so they started walking, which meant they started walking away from me when it was time to change a nappy and saying no and wriggling and squirming and it was just this horrible thing and every time I had to change a nappy I fretted and I hated it. And um, at one point I was on the internet and reminded that, um, hang on, I can't just go up to these people and say I'm going to take your clothes off and even if it's cold and uncomfortable and you don't like it, I've got to approach it respectfully like a human being. So I changed the narrative and two different ways was um, uh, asking for cooperation. So, hey, it's time to change your nappy now. Would you like to go and find the wipes for me and, and help me do that? Or the other one was, it's time to do your nappy. I know you don't like doing that at the moment, but we've got to do it. So would you like to choose if we change it while you stand up or lay down? And simply approaching them in this manner um, confidently, uh, they would just, it was like these different kids. They'd go, mm. okay, no problems. And they'd go, oh, standing up, please. Or they'd go and get the wipes. And um, it's just like, it's like a magic, it's like a piece of magic. And the other thing, which you had two children of the same age, and sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's more mm. difficult, but Agreed. the other thing which is really important is 
you know, so with me, it was like when I had Dara and Killian, it'd be like, I'd say to Dara, Dara, I'm just going to take Killian into the bedroom and change his nappy. Mm. I'll be back in a minute. Like, it's really yes. important. Like, you don't just yes. disappear. Like, yes. all of these people who, who are with their children and then their children are sitting there playing and then they just, you know, eventually your children get used to you going into the mm. kitchen and coming back. With them. But it's good to tell them, like, again, 100%. communicate with them. Yes. I'm just going to take. Killian into the bedroom and change his nappy. I'll be back in a minute. Like, mm. or even with with Daryl when he was, you know, a small or any child when they're a small baby and they're lying on the play gym and you need to go to the toilet. Mummy's going to go to the toilet. I'll be back in a minute. They might cry. They yes. might get upset. Yeah. You know, and say I'll be back in a minute. And then they, you know, you're in the toilet and still you can sort of mm. still call yeah. out to them a bit. Mm-hmm. But it really helps them to c- communication. Mm. But it also helps them when they get bigger. Like some people find that their two-year-old has to come in the toilet mm-hmm. with them and they can't get out of sight mm-hmm. because it's like they remember that mum was there and then she disappeared. For an unknown amount of and time. they may get upset yeah. and that's okay, and then, but you will come back yes. and they'll learn that you do come back yes. and it's okay if they get a little bit upset. Yeah, and I love that because um, you've told them you're going to the toilet so it will take a few times for them to learn that the toilet only means a few yes. minutes, um, whereas I'm going to the shops, hey, that's going to be a bit longer. Um, so you're right, they they it might sort of starve off that um, separation anxiety because they've learned to trust mum when she says she's going to the toilet. She's only going for a couple of minutes. If she's going to the shop, she'll be going for longer. And I love too that you would then leave baby there. I'm going to the toilet and baby might get cross, you said, and that's okay. And baby's allowed to have feelings and, and we should when validate you've got twins. Them. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, you know, I know you want me to stay. Um, yeah, that's annoying that I'm going to leave you for a couple of minutes. Um, and and validate and acknowledge the feelings and go to the toilet and come back and say, How'd you go? And and the more you ask and um talk to your child in these sorts of scenarios you're going to learn as well so before your baby's verbal you're going to learn those all important cries and sounds and cues and facial expressions um because you're giving them the opportunity to you're telling them what you're about to do and then you're observing their response and the other thing which is really important Mm. is uh, Sid Daddy's going to change your nappy. Yes. You know, see, so Daddy's, you know, and oh, get. because should have done more well, of that. Well, because <laughs> they you, not want dad you to reach a point things. where they just, and where they, it's like they don't want Dad to put them to yes. bed. And then you have like, Mum's always put them to bed every single night. And then suddenly Dad has to do it. And then it's big, and then it's like, what do we do? Well, get, like, Dad's our hands on involved. Yes. But for some strange reason, we still often. Our, in our, it's routine. Mm. It's back to us being robots. Mm. It's mm. like, you know, dad always changed the nappies and dad in our house and Nathan had to. He kept telling the midwives that he wasn't going to change. I find it interesting that I call the nurses in the special care baby unit yeah. where I were midwives. Yes. And you call them nurses. I think that's because I think in NICU, I think they're specialised intensive care nurses. nurses. And I think in special care they're midwives. Yeah, I think I it's different. That someone the other day too when we were someone talking. needs to answer us on yes, that. Please. And I know it's another name came back to me. There was a lady called Sue. It's so annoying because I loved these midwives. There was Lisa, one called Lisa, Sue and, and there was one called Lisa. Lisa. I can't believe <laughs> no, you remember name. Lisa's name. And, yeah. and there's one in particular in the la- when I had Kieran at Francis Perry, but then I moved to Geelong. She just had she was a grandmother and she'd like was saying that she got my book and stuff and she was so excited and and I just, I just can't remember her name. It's really upsetting oh, I know. me. Yeah, I wish there was. You could go to a website and look them all up. But, but, um, but like back to Nathan, getting dads involved. Na- yeah, but so yeah. they kept telling Nathan. He had to. Nathan kept saying, "I'm not changing anyone. Right it's not my job." And, and they thought he was like being serious, and they were getting yeah. quite upset with him. But it was quite a thing. Like Nathan's hands are massive, mm. and Nathan had to put these hands in oh. through these windows yeah, of this humidity crib and change the nappy through oh, the windows bless. with yeah, all wow. of these midwives yes. standing around watching, <laughs> and then Shannon and Andrew on the next. Humidity Crib, who right. we ended up being really good friends yeah. with, uh, watching as well. Like poor Nathan was like under the spotlight. Oh, and bless. But then what would happen is, so I don't know how we got into the habit, but it was like Nathan would do all this stuff with Dara, mm. but then I think it was like I'd be the one who just put him in the cot. I don't know why. Mm. It was like mm. Nathan would wrap him everything, hand me, put him in the cot. And then mm. one night when I'm not there, mm. 
and like we're like robots. It's all done the same way. I think I they think, don't want to go to bed because yes. and it's like, oh, and even now it drives me <laughs> insane. Like it drives me absolutely insane. I shouldn't yes. admit this, yeah. but I work from home, mm. and sometimes I'm just dying for Nathan to get home. Yes, so that I can sit down and work uninterrupted. Mm. And the terrible thing is I often just work around that half six, half six, after dinner, mm. before the kids are going to bed. And it's like Nathan is a lifesaver and he has every Monday night at 7, 7.30, he has a life-saving meeting. Mm-hmm. And he gets to switch off and have this meeting. Me, and I love my children, don't get me wrong, but it's like Nathan puts the kids to bed and then they lie in bed going, Mom! <laughs> Mommy, yep, mommy, and I still have to stop what I'm doing, yes. stop working. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it, but you don't have to say that. But Nathan that. goes to work, yes. like he leaves the house he for his, and he goes yeah. to a surf club meeting, and then he goes away on a surfing weekend. Yeah. He does it. I don't want to leave my children. Mm-hmm. People say to me, "Oh, let's go away on a girls' weekend," and it's like, no, if I've got a weekend, I want to be with my kids. Of course, I love my kids, and yes. my idea of fun is being with my kids, but. I'd also like the fact I'd love to like get a pen and paper out and work out how many times have you put the bed and how many mm. times have I put mm. like I actually have mm. the whole evening off mm. and it gets me back to my childhood we used to lie in bed and we'd go they're getting me back they're mm. getting me back for what we did to my mum we'd lie in bed and we'd go one two three mommy <laughs> one two <laughs> three <laughs> And we'd all scream it. And then, and now I realise she was probably just exhausted. Well, she was. She was probably just downstairs. She was a teacher. She was a full-time. My mum was the president of Ladies Hockey in Ireland. She was a hockey umpire. She was a sports teacher. She was a mum. I don't know how she got us all out the door. And they didn't have the same. They didn't have dishwashers in the same time. And they had to go to the shops to pay the bills and stuff. Like how she, I don't know how. But then eventually when she didn't come, we'd go, no. No, we didn't call dad. What'd you do? So we'd go, one, two, three, Prince! And we'd whistle and the dog would come running upstairs oh. and then mum would come running upstairs to get the dog Good out of her bedroom. Oh, my goodness. And that is so cheeky. She should have just locked the dog outside. Yes. Yes. Do you know what cheeky is? Do you want to know how bold I was as a child? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So <laughs> we lived in this house. There was no side gates, so you had to go through the house. So you had to take the bins through the house. Out. Like They didn't have side gates. Like here you've got houses with side gates, but our houses were like all attached. So to get the bins out, you had to walk through the entire house with the bin. Mm. Yeah, to put mm-hmm. it out in the street. Like, mm-hmm. anyway, we lived in this house. There was no side gates. And we had a goldfish pond in the middle of the garden. And I can't remember why, but I cut my sister's doll's clothes up. So my sister got, I think, red doll's clothes and I got pink. So I yeah. cut the red ones up. I must have been about two or three years old, oh, yeah? Well then. And I cut the doll's clothes up. And my mum locked me in the back garden. And I was very, very clever. I've always been ultra, ultra clever. So mum locked me in the back garden and I wanted to get inside. Right. Yeah. So how was I going to get inside? Open the door? No. I got in the goldfish pond and started screaming that I was drowning. Oh, you are so and She cheeky. came running out. She got me and she never locked oh, me in the back garden again because she thought I'd fallen in. And I climbed in so yes. carefully backwards and I held. And I can remember to this day being in that freezing cold goldfish pond, screaming for my mum and pretending I'd fallen in. Oh, Mum, you better very, not listen to the podcast. Very cheeky indeed. That's the So that's of, baby talk. It? Now, mm. I think it's time for a reader's question. Yeah, we've hopped on for long enough today, I think. So, uh, oh, so each week <clears throat> we're going to take a reader's question. This is a good time to explain. Mm-hmm. So we're doing the podcast weekly. We're not always going to record them every single week. No. So we're recording ahead. So yep. we'll be recording them weekly, but it's like we're not recording them the same time. Obviously, you know that from podcasts right now. We're going to be giving away prizes. So if you go to the Instagram page, so we launch competitions. So the Instagram competition this week is, do you know the answer to this, Zoe? Mm-hmm. If a child fell overboard, mm. who would I scream for? No, who's the, the second, second person. person I'd scream for? Do you know the answer? I think so. Am so, I allowed to say it or not? Yeah, go on. Is it Mrs. Kelly? Yeah. So it's like, I'd like to think I'd jump in and that's in podcast one, but I yeah. wouldn't. I'd stand yeah. in my life Call jacket calling Nathan, 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 Nathan. Anyhow, that's yeah. funny. And then the kids asked me about what's, where did Save Our Sleep come from? So one of the questions on Instagram eventually mm. is going to be, mm. right, mm. where did the name Save Our Sleep come from? Ooh. 
So eventually, in some random time in the future, here is the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I lived in London, mm -hmm. there was, they were going to build Terminal 2. Mm -hmm. There's now like Terminal 6 have been built, I think. And there was all these picketers saying, save our sleep, save our sleep, save our sleep. So the answer will be from people picketing, protesting, because they wanted to save their sleep. So the answer will be Heathrow Airport. So when we ask, ah. where did the name Save Our Sleep come from? The answer on Instagram will be Heathrow Airport. So watch out for that competition, right? And what then, do we win? $50 gift voucher for Save oh. Our Sleep. Is that good? Is yeah. that what we want to win? Yeah. Okay. So that was one thing. Now, the other thing, yeah, so touch on that, you know, Instagram. And also, can you let us know? Can you give us feedback? Mm. Can you tell us what you like? If you like hearing about Zoe's gestational, gestational diabetes, diabetes yep. if you like hearing stories of the past of yes. us, give us feedback yep. of what you like. And questions, and quest more and more No, the, you have to go to the support group for the questions. Okay. So there can be questions general, but if you want to ask a question and have it featured on the podcast, yes. you need to join the support group. You join the support group by it's prevention in the show notes. is better than yep. the cure. Yep. And you get your bedding. Yep. And Save Our Sleep's got smoke-free bedding, mm -hmm. which is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And then you join the support group etc. And then you ask your question on the podcast thread in there. Right. Today's question is from Ashley. And she says, my mum or my baby's grandmother says that because I'm still wrapping my six month old, uh, the baby, oh, sorry, my six month old baby, it's the reason why he's not yet crawling. Could the wrapping be stopping him from crawling? That's a really, really interesting question. No. I think it would take up a whole episode to answer that. Do you want me to answer it? I actually have some personal opinions on that too. So could we could we just butt in and do a little episode on that? Okay, question? so we've been going through the book. It's a good time to do it. Let's okay. make this our thing. So well, we're, we're going through the one. book and we're just about to start chapter two. So why don't we make episode six on crawling? Something okay. different. Yeah, great. On yes. moving and crawling and wrapping. Uh, gross so, motor skills yes. and development. Yes. yes. Yeah. So we're well, not all we're not experts in that, no. but you might be. But, no. but anyway, so <laughs> no, episode no six. So anything. have we got another question um, that we could do for today? Yeah, let me just bring one up here. All right, let's let's try Courtney's question. What to do for oversupply issues when the routines want you to express so much? I have had mastitis and multiple blocked milk ducts, but the routines and this forum are adamant about expressing, which I don't understand. So when Courtney says this forum, she means to say what she does. Group. Yeah. Well, it, that's a really your hard as well, question routines. to answer just without actually talking to her because – the routines in the first few days, we do say to express. So I say that you have to express on the routines to cover growth spurts. Mm. So when you so clever. So when you're feeding your baby, mm. if you're feeding them a set amount, your breasts get used to this set not a set amount. When mm. you're feeding one baby, mm. if the baby feeds for like twenty five minutes, and when we say twenty five minutes, we mean twenty five minutes sucking time. So you might do three minutes, take them off, burp them. Mm. Three minutes, take them off. It's 25 minutes sucking time, not 25 minutes Thanks from the start to the end of yep. the feed. And then if you're feeding your baby, then you, at some point, your baby will have a growth spurt, they need more food. But because our bodies are like dairy cows, which I often get contradicted for saying mm. we're like dairy cows, mm. your body ends up making a set amount, which is really good and stops Very engorgement. Yes. But if your baby has a growth spurt, yes. there might not be enough milk. Mm. So I say in the routines... And people often say in routine, this it says express 30 mils. Mm. The next routine says 60. The next says 90. And the next says 30. That's because when you go down to 30, they're roughly having a growth spurt and the extra milk's in your boobs to feed them. Okay. So you need to express to cover the growth spurts. Mm. Now, when someone says they've got engorged, I always want to say, did you follow the feeding advice in the hospital? So did you put the baby on each boob for three minutes in the first 24 hours? and then six minutes in the next 24 hours, mm -hmm. and then nine minutes in the next? Mm -hmm. Or did you put the baby on and let them suck, 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 suck? Because mm -hmm. how you normally get engorged bruises mm -hmm. is you've put one baby on and let them suck, 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 to the point where your body thinks you've got a one-year-old who needs a five-hour feed. And you end up, when your milk comes in, having so much milk because your body right. thinks... 
needs that, it that. needs all this extra milk. I'd love to work out why your mm. body hasn't worked it out yet, but it hasn't. After all this time. You know, because yeah. like what used to happen in society that mm. was different, mm. I don't know. Mm. But, mm. you know, was they always did routines and have we suddenly gone away from that? Mm. Like was the old wise mm. tales, like you said earlier, that this land has been used for, what, 70,000 mm. years? Mm. So 70,000 years ago, mm. did the old wise woman in the tribe, in, mm. are they, can we say uh, tribe? What's... No, uh, in the family yeah. did she tell a woman yeah. only to feed for three minutes have exactly. we just gone back to old fashioned advice so I want to know did this courtly lady mum yes. did she really follow or does she think she followed her because she just thought well I'm gonna do three hour feeds in hospital like you know because I don't think she could have actually truly mm-hmm. followed it mm-hmm. and then ended up with engorged breasts however mm-hmm. out of one in about 300 mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. yes somebody might follow it mm-hmm. And they might have followed it exactly. And they might, for some reason, end up with it. And then you need to seek medical advice because that's not normal. If you have followed the routines from day one and followed the times, Mm -hmm. you should not end up with engorged breasts. And if you do, you will need to express for comfort. It's so, so important to not go, I've got really engorged boobs. Because let's think about it. You've got no milk. Then your milk starts coming in and your boobs get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. And then you end up with all this milk. And then all these people say, including myself, oh, I've got so much milk, I'm so engorged. Mm. And then they stop the expressing, they stop mm. this. And then I did this is it you. six weeks? Yeah. They get to six weeks and their body suddenly goes, oh, I've worked it out. We've got one baby, in your case, two babies. Yeah. We don't need that much milk. Vroom! Yeah. And it pulls the supply back. And yeah. it's like, so you get kind of engorged about six weeks and then suddenly your supply drops. Mm. And then you don't have enough milk. So, mm. yes, you do need to express. Mm. It's so important to yeah. express. And if you don't want to express and follow my routines with your first baby, by the time you have a second baby, the expressing isn't as important. Well, but why? If you, why? Do I, because does that your mean I don't have to much? get used to the milk. You've sort of got more of a feeling of what your boobs and they get okay. used to it. You still should, okay. but it's not <laughs> as important. You might find that you can express a little bit less. Okay. Or okay. Yep. It's like your body gets more used to. Sure. You know, the first time you're feeding a baby, you yes. really need to help your boobs bring them yeah. in and, and, so and learn what to yeah. do. Right. Okay. So then if you're not going to express, don't follow the routines minute by minute until eight weeks. Okay. Okay. So don't follow them until eight weeks if you're not going to express. What to do instead? Uh, just roughly follow them. Okay. Use them as a guide. Okay. You know, right. And because you may need to feed your baby yeah. more. Or actually, the other thing is that topic that we really get in trouble mm. for talking about. Mm. You could give formula. Mm. So if you don't want to express mm. and you, when your baby goes through a growth spurt, you could give your baby formula. But then you've got to be really careful because you need to give formula at the same time every day. So you might find that when you first give your, all of these people say, mm. oh, give the baby a bottle of formula at the last feed at night. That's a stupid thing, silly thing to do because yeah. a baby, when it first has formula, gets really hungry. Okay. So they're going to wake up in the middle of the night more hungry than normal. Right. So you would give formula at the same time every day. If you don't want to express, you could give some formula at the mm-hmm. same time every day. Mm-hmm. But just watch out for your baby getting unsettled at night. They mm-hmm. might get hungrier at first and it will pass. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they're intolerant okay. to the formula. And we yeah. have on our website small tins of formula. Like mm-hmm. we have little 400 gram just in case tins. We're the yes, only people so who do them as far as I know. Mm-hmm. So most people have 900 gram tins, but we do these little small tins so that when your baby's first born, you can just have a little small tin. Or if you're only using formula once a day or you're only using formula in your baby's solids, we have these little small tins. So look Mm -hmm. out for those. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that's it, I think. That's it. We will talk about crawling in episode six. Yep. Look forward to it. Thanks so much, Tizzy. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. Bye. You have been listening to the Save Our Sleep podcast, brought to you by the International Baby Whisperer Proprietary Limited. You will find more information about the Save Our Sleep philosophy, product support, and how to watch the mini clips that accompany this podcast at saveoursleep.com. You may find the Save Our Sleep social media accounts by searching Tizzy Hall on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, for all my how-to videos and to watch the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate the podcast and share it with your friends. I would like to thank Zoe Starr for co-hosting, Ben at Fundamental Studios Geelong, 
for the amazing podcast recording room, Nick Dale at Primer Films for this production, and most of all, you, the listeners. Without you, there would be no reason for this podcast. Please enjoy, stay safe, and Zoe and I will look forward to chatting with you again next week. Thank you.